the death of Vern Animacula. Animalcula. Sounds like a, some kind of vampire or something. It isn't actually. The Cambrian explosion has been a problem for uh, the uh, theory of evolution for a long time, all the way back to Darwin, who said it was a valid objection against his theory. And his claim was that, well, the record is incomplete. And so what you really had was gradual development of these things uh, instead of them all being suddenly in the record at one time. And uh, it's just that it wasn't preserved before now. It's getting harder and harder to make that case. There was no gradual inc increase in the complexity of organisms between the late Precambrian and the Cambrian. Um, instead, the phyla spring forth basically fully formed. There is some argument as to whether there are embryos, um, but as we see, the, the, um, uh, the discussions in that case are also uh, under some dispute. And it's still a problem. And so Ediacaran fauna have been found, but they don't appear to be ancestral to the Cambrian fauna, which means that you have these critters that don't have ancestors. And actually, the, the Ediacaran fauna make it worse because we know something was being preserved during that time period. And uh, it doesn't, uh, and yet we don't see the uh, earliest mollusks or the earliest um, um, earliest uh, crustaceans or the earliest uh, uh, vertebrates or anything like that, starfish. Uh, notice that um, there are bilaterians, there are animals that have two sides, insects, spiders, uh, frogs, uh, lizards, people have a right and a left side that are roughly equivalent to each other. And uh, they're called bilaterians. There are other animals that have radial symmetry, things like um, corals, hydra, jellyfish, and uh, they don't have a head and a tail, and especially if they eat, they suck everything into the mouth and then they spit it right back out the same hole. And in order to get from a, a, another animal to one that is bilateral symmetry, you have to have an ancestor that sooner or later has bilateral symmetry as well. So, some paleontologists, guided by their faith in evolution, have looked for more primitive animals that might be ancestral to our present animals in the late Precambrian layers. So, we have the saga of Verna animalcula, um, which basically is uh, a Greek-Latin hybrid for small spring animal. Our story begins in science in the year 2004 and uh, in an article entitled Small Bilaterian Fossils from 45 to 55 million years before the Cambrian. Uh, it's by a number of different people. Uh, Jinwon Chen is the primary author. David Botcher is a prominent author. Um, and there are a number of different uh, uh, universities involved in this. And um, the uh, abstract reads 10 phosphatized specimens of a small, less than 180 micrometers, animal displaying clear bilaterian features have been recovered from the Duchanteau formation in China. I'm probably butchering that, but 
uh, dating from 40 to 55 million years before the Cambrian. The Cambrian is supposed to start at about 540 million years, so we're talking about 580 to 605 million years, uh, according to the standard uh, uh, standard way of counting things. Um, seen in sections, this animal, new species they're naming it, uh, Guishao Ena is just from the Guishao formation, or the Guishao region, um, had paired columns extending the length of the gut paired external pits that could be sense organs, bilateral anterior posterior organization, a ventrally directed anterior mouth with thick walled pharynx, and a triploblastic structure. The structural complexity is that of an adult rather than a larval form, so they think this is not a larva. These fossils provide the first evidence confirming the phylogenetic inference that bilateria rose well before the Cambrian. So what did they find? Well, they talk about the highly elaborated bilaterian animals of the early Cambrian, this is the Cambrian explosion animals, imply a complex prior evolutionary process they had to have ancestors, and the ancestors had to gradually get b uh, more and more complex. Uh, I mean, they don't apply it on their own, of course. They only apply it because you're overlaying uh, on them the theory of evolution. That has, however, remained enigmatic. In other words, they need to be there, but they can't find them. The earliest unequivocal bilaterian forms in the fossil record are from the Ediacaran biota, e, for example, the mollusk like Kimberella. Ediacaran fossils are estimated to extend down to about 20 to 30 million years before the lower Cambrian boundary. So that's the entire fauna, okay, I guess, although I thought it was back further than that. Um, which is now dated at 543 plus or minus 1 million years before the present. Uh, sometime I should bring you a, a slide of what has happened to the dating of the, of the uh, Cambrian, lower Cambrian boundary, which is quite fascinating and uh, makes you wonder about that plus or minus 1. A recent phylogenetic analysis of metazoan protein evolution indicates that the last common an uh, bilaterian ancestor the last ancestor of the, both the insects, the proterostomes, uh, arthropods, and the vertebrates and the starfish, the deuterostomes, um, primary mouth and secondary mouth uh, translation from the Greek, um, and the divergence of the main bilaterian branches occurred between the, the end of a long period of intermittent worldwide glaciation about 600 million years ago. So in other words, they're expecting to find something about 600 million years ago. So this 580 to 600 million years is just right where they want it. And the Cambrian boundary, although this divergence time is more recent than concluded in previous analyses, which are reviewed in six. So in other words, people thought it actually went back further, but now with molecular uh, genetics comparing the sequences, they say, well, it must have been closer to our time about 600 million years ago. The last common bilateral, bilaterian uh, ancestor had to possess sufficient complexity to display the definitive shared characteristics of the bilaterians bilateral symmetry, more or less, anterior-posterior body plan organization with dorsoventral specializations, gut with oral and anal openings, localized sense organs, and body composed of mesodermal, endodermal, and ectodermal layers. If you're 
uh, familiar with embryology, you understand what they're talking about. The ectodermal is the outer layer, that's the skin. Turns out also your eyes and your brain are derived from ectodermal tissue and your spinal cord. And if that doesn't close over, people wind up with either spina bifida on the bottom end or um, uh, uh, anencephaly on the top end. And of course, anencephaly is not compatible with uh, further life. And spina bifida requires some special work to make it compatible with uh, life. Um, the endoderm is the gut, and then the, the uh, mesoderm is all the other tissue. Um, and that includes such things as the pleura, the lining around the lungs, and the pericardium, the lining around the heart, and the uh, uh, peritoneum, the lining around the gut. So they're saying that, uh, that this particular little critter actually has all three of those kinds of layers. The uh, last common bilaterian ancestor required the genomic apparatus to erect such complex body plans in the process of development. Thus, it must have possessed the genetic toolkit for development shared by all bilaterians, insects and people, as well as the type of complex gene regulatory program that underlies all voluntary and developmental processes. Um, because otherwise they would have had to have it, arisen twice and that's just not mathematically rational. Of course, whether it would have arisen once is not really mathematically rational either, but we'll let that pass. Um, The last common bilateral ancestor was predicted to have been microscopic in dimension and could well have lacked any very distinctive external features. A little almost protozoan. Um, Ariel. Do they, do they uh, have a model for the, um, where the deuterostomes came from? I mean, uh, are they ignoring the... Uh, Salenterates and uh, uh, that whole group there as the ancestor of man? Well, they're saying this is a common ancestor of man and insects, and it goes oh, yeah. back at least 600 million I years. I know, but they seem to be bys bypassing the traditional interpretation of zoologists uh, of these. As, as they noted, many people thought it went back further than that. Yeah, of course, and no, no fossils there to, to uh, tell you what really happened. Uh, but uh, I wonder what they're doing about this group. But they go on to say, here we describe microscopic bilaterian fossils from the Dushanto Formation Southwest China dating from 580 to 600 million years ago. <coughs> Radiometric dates, of course. The fossils derived from a stratum containing the earliest multicellular animal form yet recovered, all microscopic in scale. <coughs> Thus far, this assemblage has consisted of adult and embryonic sponges, some cydnarian-like forms, that's uh, uh, hydra and things like that, mm -hmm. and diverse eggs and embryonic stages that could include some of bilateral provenance, and could not, who knows. The uh, Neoproteronic uh, Dushanto Formation at Wenqing, Guizhou Province, and that's where they get the, uh, the name uh, Guizhou Anu or whatever it is back above, uh, overlies a tillite demarcating perhaps the latest glaciation in the region. And uh, so they're, they're giving uh, the geologic area which they're founded in, and, and it's supposed to be 580 to 600 million years old, so it's the perfect place to look. And the fossils discussed here, as well as many additional complex animal forms, derived from a basal black bituminous phosphorite layer of the lower Wang'an phosphorite member. So they've, 
people have found other stuff in this, in this same area. And uh, then uh, they overlie the Duchenteau, oh, pardon me, Dolostones of the Dengue Formation overlie the Duchenteau Formation and contain Cambrian small shelly fossils near the top. So it's below the Cambrian, so that's, uh, that makes it nice. Uh, ten specimens were examined in this study. The three best preserved specimens, together with color-coded interpretation of Vernam, Vernanomacula gusauena, uh, are shown in figure one, and close-ups of two additional well-preserved specimens are in figure two. We consider the specimens reproduced in figure 1A1, the holotype. Measurement on all studied specimens, including two that may be a closely related species, are in table 1. And the salient features of the fossils, uh, so they're going to describe all that. Now, I'll, I'll notice that if you're reading this, it does not immediately jump out that they've looked over uh, something like 50,000 uh, little tiny grains. Uh, that they thought might be animals, and most of them turned out not to be what they were looking for. Um, but they did find these ten. Uh, however, unlike the AP dimensions, the width consists partly of coelomic space and is thus subject to de local deformation as well as expansion due to squashing and or decay processes. So they're looking at animals that actually have hollow areas on either side of them. Um, microscopic dimensions of the original animal were only about the size of a modern indi indirectly developing marine larva, although its multi-layered anatomical structure is much more complex. And then uh, they go through some of the parts that they're that they're looking at. The digestive tract of this animal extends from the mouth to where it joins the posterior body well, wall, mm -hmm. seen most completely in the specimen figure 1b, one 1b2. One B the digestive tract is flanked by paired coelums, uh, clearly aligned both medially and distally with a heavy walled epithelium like layer of uniform thickness. And uh, What's coelum? Or coelum? C O E L E M. And um, that is the, uh, that's okay, keep it for your next comment, or somebody else's next comment. <laughs> uh, the, the colum is, um, in humans, is eventually that cavity is divided up into the pleuris, pleural space, the pericardial space, and the peritoneal space. If you operate on a, on a human, you'll find, or a rat for that matter, I mean, any, any uh, mammal will do. Uh, in fact, I think any uh, reptile will do too. Uh, you'll find that the intestines are not just stuck into the stomach. They're actually, they have a layer, a very thin layer on top of them, a uh, peritoneum. And then the whole thing is lined with peritoneum. And what it does is it allows the intestines, as they're trying to move food around and stuff, to kind of slide back and forth. Uh, it's a more efficient design feature than it is if, they, if all of that was just connective tissue. And then, and then as, as food tried to go through, it would find a harder time distending one part of the mm -hmm. intestines and then another this way everything can kind of adjust to the difference in size. Uh, the lungs actually is kind of interesting because the pleura allows the lung when you use the diaphragm and only inflate the lower portion of the lungs, the whole lung slides down and then when you let it out it slides back up and, and inflates evenly instead of just inflating the bottom part of the lung. It's actually quite a, a neat. From many thousands of rocks, uh, thin sections, we identified as specimens of this animal only one out of every 5,000 to 10,000 microfossils that were examined. Ah, now you catch that. Um, 
However rare this, the animal is, the conditions for the fossilization of its internal structure were certainly rare, and its preservation must have depended on local taphonomic factors. And they named the species, and they go through the phylogenetic and evolutionary implications, which is the exciting part for them. Vernon Amacula is, an amacula is uh, by far the earliest organism of bilaterian form so far found. It appears in strata that overlie the last of several extreme glacial or proposed snowball earth episodes. This is in the Precambrian when there was supposedly an ice age. And this age is consistent with the general chronological predictions of phylogenetic analysis in reference six, given that it belongs to the stem group of, and here's it. Here's their kind of drawing of how it looked. And let's see, I should, no, I don't have it. Uh, their actual sections. Um, one or another bilaterian clade, its small size, its simple external morphology, and its lack of obvious appendages also conform to the morphological and developmental predictions that have been made in another reference. Beyond this, However, these fossils are in many ways surprising. Vernon Amalcula is complex in structure and represents an almost textbook example of the body plan of an adult, triploblastic colomate, yet its dimensions are minute. As noted elsewhere, some aspect of the Duchanteau environment was not consistent with the existence of macroscopic animal forms. Mm -hmm. So, they're looking at this and they're saying, um, we have now found um, the ancestor of all of the animals that have a mouth and an anus. It's far enough back in the, few, in the past that it could do that under the standard models. And, um, you know, it just looks obvious that there are cells there. Um, furthermore, the organization of these fossils taken together with their provenance indicates that the genetic toolkit and pattern formation mechanisms required for bilaterian development had already evolved by the Duchenteau times long before the Cambrian. And what that means is the Cambrian explosion wasn't an explosion after all, there were these little critters to begin with, and so they could diverge into all kinds of different kinds of animals. Um, therefore, the diversification of body plans in the early Cambrian followed from the very deployment of these mechanisms once conditions permitted, not from their sudden appearance at or just below the Cambrian boundary. So people who emphasize the Cambrian explosion are making too much of it. That, of course, is intelligent design people, among others. Well, this really captured the popular fancy. Just one example among another, uh, several others. Um, uh, it got announced in Scientific American, Discover, uh, earliest bilaterian fossil discovered by Leslie Mullen, and there's the reference for this particular one. And, uh, See, before the Cambrian 550 million years ago, most life on Earth was composed of bi bi bacteria and single-celled animals. But then something happened to cause an explosion of complex multicellular body forms. Scientists have long been puzzled about why this burst of diversity occurred. Some have suggested that a sudden rise in oxygen allowed larger and more complex forms to appear and develop. Others have suggested that animal complexity started long before the Cambrian and that we have only failed to find the fossil evidence of it. And of course, uh, Chen and Botcher and so forth are in the latter camp. So they have now reported this in the journal Science. And uh, by the way, here's a photomicrograph of, uh, taken from the original article. And you can see that you, know, you can talk yourself into these being um, uh, cells, with little cell walls, and, and uh, Here's a one lining here, and there's another lining there, and uh, this is apparently a uh, 
a sagittal, or pardon me, a horizontal section through this critter because you can see the mouth here and the intestines or whatever you want to call it there. And then the anus at the end is kind of taken out of this particular specimen, but <coughs> one can certainly imagine it being there. Um, this discovery helps us to learn more about the er murky origins of bilaterian animals, which are most of what we see on Earth. Evolution is all its problem solved, of course. You and I would have to go scuba diving to see Sydnerians and sponges, Botner said in the Science Magazine release. So they made a, they didn't just write the article, they actually made a little uh, noise about it. Because they knew what they were doing. They were satisfying a long-term requirement of, evolu of evolution that had not been satisfied before. The Du Shantou formation in China's Guizhou province is a phosphate rock formation that developed in a shallow sea uh, 580 to 600 million years ago. These rocks are already famous for having yielded the oldest known multi-celled embryos. Mm. And uh, so they're, they're looking at this thing. And uh, there's their translation, small spring animal. And then Guzhaina is from Guizhou. Guizhou, I guess it is. Guizhou? Guizhou. Guizhou. Uh, somebody actually knows Chinese. Zhou, OK. And um, as we keep going down here, uh, the vernanomacular fossils suggest that maybe complex animals were around beforehand before the Cambrian explosion, and it was just mm -hmm. the ability to grow large that caused the Cambrian explosion, Butcher said in the science release. The Cambrian explosion may have had a really long fuse, he added. So this is a big deal. Now they have, one, discovered the earliest bilaterian animal. Two, they're probably not going to be beaten by anybody anytime soon. And Three, they've solved an evolutionary conundrum that uh, creationists and intelligent design people keep bringing up to them. How come all these animals appear fully formed? Well, not everyone agreed. There's a comment on small bilaterian fossils from 40 to 55 million years before the Cambrian by Stephen Bengston and Graham Budd. And this was same year. They said, hey, wait a minute. and um, they say Chan et al. reported colomate bilaterians from the uh, about 600 million year old Dushanto uh, phosphorites in southern China. Such a find might meet some common expectations of small, simple bilaterians emerging after the worldwide glaciation of the Neoproterozoic. The interpretation is not well founded, however, because it fails to take into full account taphonomy. That's changes in the organization after death, organism after death, and diagenesis, changes in the sediment after deposition. The specimens presented by Chen et al. represent a common mode of preservation of microfossils in phosphat phosphatic uh, sediments, including those of the Duchenteau and the overlying Denying formations. A more or less underformed, undeformed outer membrane, a shrunken irregular internal mass often connected to the outer membrane by occasional threads or sheets, and thin layers of diagenetic minerals, commonly apatite, calcium phosphate, lining the surface of the resulting cavities. And that's why they're called phosphate beds, by the way, because they have a lot of apatite, which uh, is largely calcium phosphate. Such diagenetic minerals usually have a characteristic crystallographic structure due to the growth direction normal to the encrusted surface. Chen et al. have provided no information on the structure of the layers they interpret as cellular. But even the published fixtures, figures show clear evidence of diagenetic origin. The layers have a regular banding of color and thickness that is different between the specimens, but consistent within the individual specimens, whether counted from the outer wall inward or from the central body outward, in the direction toward what they describe as the Coelomic lumen, that's the 
third space, so to speak. Chen et al. showed a thickness sequence of approximately 2 plus 2 plus 5 micrometers, one of 3 plus 5 plus 5 within the first layer, with the first layer considerably darker than the subsequent two, and one of 2 plus 5 without any intermediate there. This pattern defies biological explanation, but is easily explained as representing two or three generations of diagenetic overgrowth. The uh, um, minerals found a, uh, a cavity, and they lined it once, and then they lined it again, and then they lined it again. And uh, then they talk about the uh, uh, rather than being sinuously folded, as would be expected from the deformed tissue layers, these layers consistently have their convex features directed towards a putative uh, cholemic lumen. This is a typical feature of diagenetic crusts, in which irregularities on the overgrown surface serve as nuclei for spherulitic fans. The layers show typical cavity filling geometry. The outermost layer is missing in narrow spaces where earlier growth left no room for it. Uh, the layers show conspicuous dark lines perpendicular to the surfaces. Chen et al. referred to these as cellular structure preserved. Cell walls may indeed be preserved in these sequences, typically by internal crust encrustation by diagenetic minerals. Surface perpendicular lines within diagenic crusts, however, more likely represent fine cracks propagated along the direction of the surface normal acicular crystallites. There are natural cracks that develop, and they develop at intervals, and so what you're looking at that look like cell walls is not actually cell walls. And here they, they have an example of a brachiopod that, they, that has had this kind of uh, Incrustation, and you can see that you get layers like that, and you even get a little bit of. Uh, if you use your imagination, you can try to make, for example, this right here into a cell wall, but in fact, it isn't. Um, and so The uh, Chen et al. concede that one thin partial coating of the layers is of diagenetic origin. They do not address, however, any of the clear indications of diagenesis in the main layers, but simply assert that they represent cellular layers because they have been consistently observed in independent specimens of the same morphological organization and similar dimensions. In view of the fact that the supposedly bilaterian specimens have been selected from among 50,000 to 100,000 microfossils, the perceived consistencies are far from impressive. You, know, you selected your data, you cherry picked basically. The supposed mouth and anus are reported from two specimens each. The putative pharynx, gut, and quillum are reported from all 10 selected specimens. But these features will be present by construct if specimens are selected that happen to have the internal lump of <coughs> shrunken matter touching or connecting with the outer wall in two places in the plane of selection. No inf information is given other than conjecture on the three-dimensional structures of the figured specimens. That all you have is just a slice and you hope that it's a slice in the proper direction. Not much help. And there is no count of the variability of any of the 50,000 to 100,000 microfossils not selected as bilaterians. As a result, even a reader unacquainted with diagenesis would be hard put to identify any morphological regularities in the specimens. Cherry pick data. And I'll leave out that last uh, that paragraph. Uh, when taphonomy and diagenesis are taken into account, the evidence that these fossils preserve minute collimate bilaterians disappears. The objects illustrated and described by Chen et al. may well be eukaryotic microfossils, but their reconstructed morphology as bilaterians is an artifact generated by cavities being lined by diagenetic crests. <coughs> 
The appearance of the fossils now has little resemblance to that of the living organisms that generated them. To paraphrase Theodosius Dobansky, nothing in paleontology makes sense except in the light of taphonomy and diagenesis. Wow. Rather critical. Well, these by, uh, people didn't want to uh, let that go, so they made a response. And that's again in 2004. Uh, and uh, Dr. there's the. Yes. Since I have the microphone. Those people who wrote that last article, do you know they're leaning? Were they evolutionists? Uh, as far as I know, yes. I, there's okay. no indication that they question the time frame so, at all. So they're not, don't, don't have a bone the, to pick. Uh, well, the one guy is Swedish. Sweden is not known as a hotbed of uh, creationism, uh, let alone intelligent, de well, intelligent design either. Uh, it's, I guess, theoretically possible. Uh, but I took the trouble to look up uh, the guy, and he had nothing on his website that would instantly make one think that he's a uh, creationist um, or or even an intelligent design advocate. <coughs> so here's their response, and a very interesting. The comment of Bengston and Budd is predicated on a preconception that any structures in, sec in section du Chanteau microfossils that are claimed to represent cellular features in the original animal must instead be diagenic artifacts. Did you catch that from? Uh, no. That's a defensive response. Uh, I think these guys are overly sensitive. This preconception, of course, is demonstrably false, but that's not the preconception that they had. They just said. Uh, well, you have to, you know, have a little skepticism if things can fit with diagenesis. Um, maybe they're animals, maybe they're not, but you can't trust this. And it seems to me like scientific skepticism is appropriate. Don't forget these people are making what is for the, for the scientific community an extraordinary claim. We have found the oldest bilaterian. Didn't I once hear somebody claiming that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? Isn't that something that's thrown against uh, people who, for example, find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones? You know, where's the skepticism on the other side? There, um, there are many examples of cellular structures and sections through other Duchenteau microfossils preserved in phosphoride, as are the vernanomicula sections. Indeed, a scanning electron microscopy image displays a very similar cleavage form, as does this section in 1D, which uh, is down here, and we'll see it in just a little bit. Um, both large and small blastomeres are demonstrated in both images. In the sections, the location of at least two essentially definitive cellular features of the original embryonic walls, that is, their boundaries, that is, cell walls, and their nuclei can easily be seen. Here's an example of a, what looks like two cells with their nuclei intact. Um, here's a, a four-celled structure. Here's a, what, six-celled? Of course, uh, you don't know the three-dimensional. Uh, thus, it is counterfactual to deny preservation of structural morphology at the cellular level in this kind of material. You guys are just wrong. Uh, turning now to uh, Vernon uh, Vernanomacula, and here's some more of their, the, and this is, by the way, one of the standard shots. Uh, I think we've seen this one before, in fact. Bengston and Bud claim that the putative cellular structures, 
are merely cracks in the fossils because they extend across the adjacent layer. This argument is false. The features in question here are the regularly spaced crosswise seams visible in many of the morphologic layers of the holotype fossil, but because these are in positions expected of cell boundaries. Perhaps the image used by Bengston and Budd was of insufficient resolution to reveal the details adequately. Here we offer another view, and there's their big view so that you can really see it well. Um, taken with polarized light under crossed <coughs> nickels. Uh, there are indeed some true cracks that traverse the holotype fossil at the plane of, of focus shown. However, a careful count of all the crosswise partitions of seams show that only 17 out of 83 could possibly be accounted for by the cracks. Just amazing. Could possibly be accounted for by cracks because the other ones don't go all the way through. But if you have some that go through and some that don't, you kind of wonder whether maybe the ones that don't just haven't gone that far. Um, the large majority of the crosswise seams are indeed best taken as the remains of cell boundaries, although this is not a point we made into in their first article. Furthermore, 1G shows another prominent and revealing feature that directly affects the argument. Virtually every one of, let's go back here, the cuboidal areas delimited by the periodic seams has a greenish spot of birefringence within it, usually towards the middle, and they're taking this as the nucleus. So, when they get done, Bengston and Bud provide images of incrustation within a fossil brachiopod as, exam as examples of diagenetic artifacts that are supposed to resemble vernanomacula. This example is irrelevant, however. It is clearly an error to s use deposits on a template of unquestioned biological origin as a model for forms that are supposed to display no biological features. It is impossible to see what they think is similar to Renanomalcula in the morphology of the encrusted brachiopod. Further, it is not obvious that their example even represents what they think it does. The branching structures in the brachiopod could well be the fossilized remains of a fungal organism. Taphonomy and diagenesis must, of course, be considered in the analysis of any novel fossil form, but the considerations of Bengston and Budd provide no answers. They cannot explain the reproducible features, the symmetrical morphology, or the internal structure or periodicity of vernanomacula fossils. Just as it would be a mistake to ignore taphonomy and diagenesis altogether, refusing to look beyond them precludes further exploration and insights into early animal evolution. Did they refuse to look beyond them or did they say there's no need to look beyond them? We confidently predict that many additional specimens of Vernanomalcula will be found before long and that they will provide an enhanced view of an anatomy and three-dimensional structure of its anatomy. Um, so they hope to be able to actually do the three-dimensional structure, which means they haven't done it yet. Discovery of this and other new forms will depend on study of further tens of thousands of specimens. There's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, that I with that, I would agree. A complete reply was made in 2012, which was just last year. And it's entitled, A Merciful Death for the Earliest Bilaterian Vernanomalcula. And it's by Bengston again, but with three new contributors. And um, the, uh, his old partner has dropped out in the meantime for this particular thing. I took the trouble to look up John Cunningham, and he is not a creationist or an intelligent design uh, advocate as far as I know either. And this is published in Evolution and Development, which is sometimes known as Evo Devo, um, and it's available on the web. Um, a Merciful Death for the Earliest Bilaterian. And again, this tells you where they're from, Sweden, uh, University of Bristol in England uh, for two of them, and then the University of Geology and Key Laboratory of Stratigraphy and Paleontology, Chinese Academy of Geological Sciences. 
And the, their summary is fossils described as Vernina malcula guizaena, guizaena. Uh, from the nearly 600 million year old Dushantou formation in southern China have been interpreted as the remains of bilaterian animals. As such, they would represent the oldest putative record of bilaterian animals in Earth history. And they have been invoked in debate over this formative episode of early animal evolution. However, this interpretation is fallacious. Boom. We review the evidential basis of the biological interpretation of Vernon and Malcula, concluding that the structures key to animal identity, identity are effects of mineralization that do not represent biological tissues, and furthermore, that it is not possible to derive its anatomical reconstruction on the basis of the available evidence. There is no evidential basis for interpreting Vernon and Malcula as an animal, let alone a bilaterian. The conclusions of evolutionary studies that have relied upon the bilaterian interpretation of Vernon and Malcula must be called into question. Uh, they introduce uh, the subject by saying in 2004, a fantastic animal fossil crept into the scientific literature. Vernon and Malcula was reportedly reported from nearly 600 million year old Neoproterozoic radiacrin phosphorites of the Duchenteau Formation in Guzal. Reconstructed as a flatulent hoopy cushion, boy, that's respectful. <laughs> This broadly circular and flattened organism was interpreted to possess a protruding mouth region leading to a pharynx, a straight gut with an expanded mid-region in glands, and an anus. It had a paired uh, coilum. Sensory pits adorned its anterior margin. The animal was small, up to about 200 micrometers in diameter. It was hailed as the first bilaterian animal in the fossil record, the small spring animal following the winter of the Neoproterozoic glaciations. This concept of Vernon and Malcula has drawn criticism at the most fundamental level. And then he lists some of the criticisms that are there. Given this contrast between the concerns over the veracity of the interpretation of Vernon and Malcula and the burden of evolutionary significance that has been placed upon this interpretation, we provide a review of its evidential basis as given in the original inscription, uh, both, uh, both of those Chen and all articles, and in a recent study, purporting to confirm the anatomy of Vernon and Malcula. And then, um, uh, I'm going to skip, obviously there's a lot more to the article. Vernon and Malcula was described to preserve layered ectothelial, mesothelial, and endothelial tissues and organs to a cellular or subcellular level. The primary reason for challenging this interpretation was that the layering is characteristic of generations of void filling diagenetic mineralizations that does not reflect original biological structure. And they cite their original uh, the original paper of Bankston and Budd. Putative cell boundaries were in the context reinterpreted as cracks propagated in the directions of the fibronormal crystals. Spherulitic structures, interpreted originally as sensor organs, glands, pharynx, and a mouth, are comparable to spherulitic fans of mineral crystals that nucleate on irregularities of the overgrown surfaces. Chenna and colleagues ignored the indications of di diagenetic origin uh, and instead built onto their case with further unique anatomical cellular and subcellular features of oddly seen in the fossils. The recent reconsiderations in the light of new specimens assign, assigned to Vernon and Malcula concludes, however, as did Bankston and Budd, that the structures identified as cellular layers were formed by diagenetic... Oh, they conceded? They concede that what may look like cell boundaries are likely optical features due to the growth habit of the crystals, and write, if these samples are indeed the remains of complex animals, the motor preservation has obscured the original fine cellular detail. So there isn't quite as much evidence as we had thought. And then uh, an area where <coughs> they talk about entering the third dimension. The entire concept of e. Gijauena is based on 
15 thin sections, one from each of the 15 individual fossils, the anatomy of which is otherwise entirely unknown. 10 of these were rock specimens described by Chen et al. The, Chen et al. the other five were made from isolated specimens without prior observation of their three-dimensional morphology. Just uh, not describing the three-dimensionals at all. In all 10 sections of Vernon and Amalcula have, have been figured, and all of these all show approximate bilateral symmetry in the occurrence of paired cavities within centripetally layered uh, walls surrounding a core of botryoidal structures. It is important to note that there is no prior reason to interpret the fossil remains of Vernon Amalcula as bilaterian. These people wanted it so bad that they were willing to just simply look past that. The fossil approach, uh, fossils approach bilateral symmetry in the plane of section, but no insights are provided into the relationship of that plane of section to the fossil organism. It may seem glib, but it is important to remember that these are slivers of rock. They may preserve, through mineral replication, features of biological structure of a once living organism, but that has to be demonstrated, not assumed a priori without justification. The skeptics uh, in science are right unless proven otherwise. And I think that's fair. Similarly, the interpretative model, in light of which anatomical homologies are to be identified in the fossil remains, must be justified a priori, or else the conclusions are at risk of circular reasoning. When the general affinity of a fossil is unknown, the safest approach is to first determine the intrinsic geometric properties of the remains, taking taphonomy and digenesis into account. And indeed, the best test of a hypothesis that the, bilaterian, or the bilateral disposition of structures in Vernon and Malcula reflect a bilateral organism is to reconstruct anatomy based on the geometric relations between structures preserved in the specimens. This is possible only if the available evidence includes three-dimensional information. In this case, represented by a number of sections in different planes and at different angles. So, and they, they haven't done that. Now, their conclusion, epistemology of a small bilaterian. And um, this is, uh, Chen Junwan, quoted by Botcher in 2005, which is a Scientific American article he wrote, there's a bilaterian in that trek. And uh, let me just continue on. The short history of research into V. Gijauena uh, reminds us of the pitfalls, not merely the interpretation of fossils, but of comparative anatomy more generally. The identification of anat anatomical homologies occurs within the context of a phylogenetic hypothesis. Yet those interpreted homologies are then marshaled as evidence of phylogenetic affinity. Uh, no. The only means of escaping this circular logic is to establish an evidential basis for the phylogenetic milieu within which homologies are to be identified because anatomical homologies are ultimately based in the relationships between parts. This is best achieved by establishing the geometric properties of intrinsic anatomical characters seen through the filter of taphonomy. The fossil remains of V. Gizioena can be rationalized on the body plans of a bilateral, bilaterian animal, but only if it is assumed a priori that they represent the remains of a bilaterian animal. There is no intrinsic evidence to justify this interpretive model, however. The available evidence indicates little more than the fact that these objects are approximately circular in cross-section and filled with generations of void-filling minerals deposited after the internal biologic structure intrinsic to the organism has decayed. There is no evidence for a bilaterian animal or even an animal interpretation. It is likely that the fossils referred to Vernon and Malcula were interpreted as bilaterians because this was, as our epigram betrays, the explicit query of its authors. They were looking for it and they found it. If you know from the beginning not only what you were looking for, but what you're going to find, you will find it, whether or not it exists. 
As Richard Feynman in 1974 famously remarked, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. After all, and after you've not fooled yourself, it's easy not to fool other scientists. Conversely, once you've fooled yourself, you will fool other scientists, or at least it's very easy to fool them. And so Vernon Malkula has been marshaled as evidential support for the timing of bilaterian evolution and of multifarious bilaterian innovations. The little spring animal has taken on a life of its own, a life it never had in the Neoproterozoic. <laughs> It is our hope that Vernon and Malkula will now be laid to merciful rest, free from the heavy burden of undue evolutionary significance that has hitherto been heaped upon it. And uh, now the last word <laughs> we'll leave to Wikipedia, which of course, as you know, is a biased in the creationist direction. But um, <clears throat> the description of Vernon and Malkula's bilateral has been challenged and refuted. Other workers in the field have repeatedly claimed that Vernon and Malkula is largely a taphonomic artifact generated by phosphate growth within a spherical object such as an acritarch. Chen et al. initially defended their interpretations of Vernon and Malkula against the claims of Bankston and Budd. That's the reference, both of those are the references we've seen. But more recent evidence indicates that Vernon Amalcula was not even an animal, let alone a bilaterian. And that's where they leave it. So, Vernon Amalcula is dead. Long live Vernon Amalcula. With that, I will leave questions and comments up to you. What is that? Is that their fanciful, or, I mean, an artistic? Rendering? Yes, they that's an artistic rendering. It has about the same significance as the Nebraska man that was reconstructed from the tooth of a pig. <laughs> uh, comment back there, and then over here. The current issue of biblical archaeology has an editorial stressing that uh, carbon dating is not all it's cracked up to be. It suggests that a conclusion based on carbon-14 usually includes the evidence of potsherds and uh, other time indicators, so it's part of a conclusion. Uh, is this true, um, that carbon-14 is not just a, a scientific uh, discovery or measurement? Well, uh, uh, yes, it's, it's partly true. Uh, Carbon-14 dating has, has two problems. One of them is you can get intrusive material sometimes. The other one is that sometimes the carbon-14 dates don't match what people thought they ought to. And it's possible that the current chronology is off. But again, if you know what you're looking for. If you know what you're looking for, you'll it find it. Then it becomes substantial. Uh, we're in the process of looking for something that I had a pretty good hunch what we were looking for. And uh, that's doing the bones from the city of Nineveh. And so far that's panned out, but, you know, that needs more testing. And that's one of the things I think we need to do whenever we're doing this. Ah, we found the silver bullet. Well, we may have found it, but you want to be really careful about saying you have found it. Because science is not made with that kind of certainty. Uh, I'd like to add a, uh, another dimension to this issue here which relates to other Precambrian fossils and so on. And that is, uh, if you go along the Savannah River uh, and drill down in the sediments in that valley, in that region, uh, you'll start uh, looking at the specimens carefully. You'll find a number of living organisms uh, way down, 600 feet down, 200 meters down. Uh, and some of those organisms are algae. Now, uh, we all know that algae need light 
to to live and so on. They're photosynthetic organisms. At least they, they need uh, if they're going to uh, propagate and so on. Uh, uh, it's helpful if they have some light. Uh, these things are 600 feet down. Uh, how could algae live 600 feet down in this total darkness? Well, well uh, th that's a problem with that because algae live for approximately 12 hours every day in near total darkness. Yeah, well. So they must have so some way of living. Uh, the, the conclusion is <laughs> they thought, well, either algae live for a very long time, uh, which uh, meant. Uh, Kind of said tongue in cheek, or they were, they, um, were transported in there, and uh, uh, the issue that I am raising here is the question of transport, and uh, I think this issue is not raised as often as it should be in the scientific literature, in terms of some of these Precambrian fossils. If you have a uh, worldwide flood, for instance, and you have the rocks cracking, uh, what is the possibility that um, uh, these uh, organisms did exist, and some of them did filter down, and maybe uh, one specimen out of 50,000, uh, you, you find one of these organisms that happened to have been transported down there. The uh, disturbance of the flood, as described in the Bible, would tend to probably facilitate this type of of uh, transport and so on. And uh, it's it's all suggested, you know. It, it's assumed in, in the literature. Hey, uh, where we find these things, this is where they uh, grew. Oh well, that's well, not true, though. Uh, if you find pollen in the Precambrian, they're quite sure that that was transported. Exactly, and these these things uh, aren't all that uh, big, as you know, <laughs> microscopic. When they talk about the 200 microns, the the the, uh, the diameter of two human hairs. So uh, that gives you uh, an idea. Uh, but you know, we, we have uh, intrusions and in rocks and cracks filled in with uh, sediments and so on. Huge, huge, huge deposits. How are we sure that hey, they, these things grew right where we found them? They've never been moved. When you have so much evidence of, I mean, if you have algae two, 600 feet down. Because uh, if you're right, you get a uh, name for yourself. Well, sure, but uh, we're, we're asking deeper questions now. Of course, <laughs> this raises the question, uh, the basic question that I think we need to ask ourselves, and that is, uh, is there any hope of finding truth when you have such uh, prevailing, predominant paradigms dictating what you want. And to, to me, this is a very important question. Uh, if you're going to base your truth on evidence, which I think is uh, extremely important. Well, I think that the key uh, is that you need to be familiar enough with areas to know, uh, you know, to what have is going some on. clue as to how much bias there actually is. No, I, and I'm it's one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is to, to help people to understand that mm -hmm. there is a lot of bias mm -hmm. that goes on and uh, much of mm -hmm. it is in one direction. And the interesting thing of it is if you mm -hmm. talk to these people, they'll tell you that creationists will say anything. Yes, well... Well, uh, maybe some will, but I know some that won't. I'm a firm believer that truth ought to make more sense than error as we use our logic and analysis and evidence and reason to try and define it or to find it. And so uh, t to me the, uh, the bottom line is uh, in these issues and so on, make sure you do your work carefully and make sure you evaluate things carefully uh, you're much more likely to find truth than if you go right in on one of these uh, uh, schools uh, of thought that goes one way or the other uh, type of thing. Uh, stay by the firm data, and I think you're more likely to find truth in there. I, well, I, I think there's I one other thing, there. and that is <clears throat> that you have to think your own thoughts because if you're always looking in the direction that other people are pointing you,
these people cherry picked yeah, that the bet. samples. <coughs> they didn't do multiple sections <coughs> of the same sample. Uh, they, um, I mean, it's pretty convincing until you realize how much, <coughs> how selected the data are. Well, if you're going to get an unbiased selection, you're going to have to do your own selection. Is what it boils down to. That's you see, mm -hmm. because you'll never find, you will never find carbon-14 in very old material presented as <coughs> a reason to question age in the secular sure. literature. Now, interestingly enough, if you know what you're looking for, you will find it. It's all over the place. But they always explain it as uh, some kind of contamination, or they leave it completely <coughs> unexplained. Um, no, uh, let me add one example here to this. Uh, I was over at UCR a while back listening to a lecture by Schopf, uh, a very famous uh, paleontologist, uh, pre-Cambrian paleontologist at UCLA. And he gave this lecture on, he claims he has found the earliest life on Earth. And uh, <clears throat> I, I thought the lecture was interesting. I was not all that impressed with it. Uh, uh, about a month later, I ran into one of the professors at uh, UCR in a uh, well, store. And we just happened to uh, recognize each other. And he said, what do you think of that lecture, you know? And I, I didn't want to be too insulting. Uh, I told him, well, I wasn't sure about this and so on. He told me, I think that lecture was junk. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> adding to that, a few months later, it comes out an article in Nature written by seven authors who had analyzed Shup's data, and they say he, he had all kinds of stuff on the slide that did not match at all. He just showed you the stuff that seemed to match his ideas. And they rejected the idea that this was the first life. But Shop, Sort of like what the people <coughs> did to Vernon and Malkula, from the sound of it. Shop is being, he, he rebutted the thing, and he's being considered to be correct. In spite of this, so uh, these schools of thought that uh, tend to dominate uh, deserve special critical analysis because you can't go by the majority uh, in this. You need to go by the solid data. Yeah. This coming up here, back. Right. Yeah, I was wondering. What is it uh, primarily that the evolutionists, not either evolutionists or theistic evolutionists have that they feel is so convincing that creationists in young earth people are just total nincompoops? I mean, is it because they don't read anything about creation and stuff like that that they've just, they've all and swept by that tide, or do they really have something that that uh, is just overwhelming evidence that everybody should believe? Well, I think there are several things that are going on there, um, and some of them are mu mutually reinforcing. Uh, I, I think number one, there's a tremendous amount of cherry picking of the evidence. Cherry picking of the evidence. Uh, In terms of um, uh, in terms of the age question, uh, people will look at um, uh, modern uh, deposits of sand in a desert, and they will ignore modern deposits of sand underwater, of which there are less, and so perhaps it's easy to ignore that, um, and they will assign a a uh, very slow time for uh, deposits such as the Coconino sandstone, the Navajo sandstone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they will ignore the question of what happens to the time between layers. 
let alone what happens to the time when there's a whole missing layer and why we don't have erosions there. And so what they've heard is all, it fits our paradigm. The evidence we see fits our paradigm. Well, the evidence we see has been cherry picked to fit the paradigm. There are still some problems with it. But if you're not familiar enough with the, uh, uh, with the story, it's, it's easy to uh, kind of assume that they know what they're talking about and they know what they're talking about in this area and they know what they're talking about. In. Now my area has a little trouble, but you know, if you look at all these other areas, they're pretty solid. And uh, I mean, how could you reverse every single field? See, with the exception of mine, but mine, mine is still compatible. And, and as long as you keep doing that, everything looks like it's overwhelming. Now you add to that two things, and, that, and one of them is that sometimes creationists have been not as careful as they should be, and you can demonstrate that. And of course, then again, they cherry pick those. Um, when they want to discuss uh, somebody, they'll bring out uh, Kent Hovind or, or Karl Baugh. Kent Hovind has uh, apparently a, a conviction for, uh, for uh, income tax evasion. Um, all of a sudden, anything he says is obviously the result of somebody who's willing to be dishonest. See? I mean, after all, wasn't he convicted of a crime? Um, even when they attack uh, for example, um, they had a reference uh, to uh, carbon-14 dating on, uh, there's only one that I know of, on, uh, it's not Panda's Thumb, it's the other one, um, I'm trying to think of what the, uh, what the website is. Uh, but they had they had this um, they had this big article, and they reference David Plaisted's website. Well, David Plaisted's website referenced my work, referenced I think the ICR work. Why didn't they go to the original literature? Because it's easier to make a, a website person a fool than it is somebody who's done the original work and is being extremely careful with how they're presenting it, you see? And so what's happening is that all that they hear is the dishonest or the creationist that you can throw that charge at and make it stick. Um, and they're not seeing all of the people who are being careful. Leonard Brand doesn't come in for any kind of criticism in that regard, you know? because he does too careful work and, and, and is careful not to overstate his arguments. But he's a creationist, just doesn't get cited in the same, same breath as these other people. And so what happens is they're seeing a biased sample of creationists, they're seeing a biased sample of what the, evolution, what the evidence for evolution is, and once you get that kind of bias, there's no surprise that you come over to a conclusion that the evidence is overwhelming and that only a dishonest people won't believe it. So that's what happens. I guess it's uh, that way in, in just about everything from politics to science to anything I know uh, a couple months ago, several months ago now, they were talking about fracking and the person, the environmentalist that <coughs> excuse me, was saying how terrible it was he said, look at all the fire on the water and everything like that. And the person brought it up. He said, that, that's, that in that area has been going on for a, 120 years. It's in, the, it's in the records that they've seen that, the, you know, whatever's on the water catches on fire from time to time. He said, it has nothing to do with that. So, you know, it, uh, it, just to discredit something that's a, that's a very obvious thing and say it has nothing to do with it. I figure, well, I guess it has nothing to do with it. Whenever science gets into a place where it starts affecting personal 
personally humans. On both sides, you'll see people start to try to use science in a way that it doesn't work very well at. And you're going to have to step back and ask some really tough questions as to who's really telling the truth. And usually the people who are telling the truth aren't making quite as big a deal of it because they know that the evidence is ambiguous. And I, I think we'll make this our last comment. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, might mention, uh, I should have, should have mentioned when I talked about this algae. It was, it's living now. I mean, they found these live cells. We were talking about live specimens there. Make sure you got that point. That, uh, so so these, these are not uh, funny looking formations down 600 meters. These oh. are little critters that can reproduce themselves. Right, right. They're, they were living organisms. And, uh, and un unless you believe in spontaneous generation, why it's pretty uh, hard. <laughs> how, how did they get down there? Obviously transported, it seems to be the thing. The Somehow other, they got uh, transported, whether they transported themselves yeah. or something else did. Uh, the other point is uh, the solution to this as far as uh, scientific data is concerned is, is more thorough work and more careful work, which is, of course, tedious. And, uh, but uh, be careful in what you do. But I do think uh, when you do look at certain things in science, uh, like the origin of life, for instance, like the gaps in the fossil record, uh, like the fine-tuned universe, uh, so so uh, carefully adjusted to support life and so on, uh, it's more reasonable to think that there is a designer, a god, and that once you've allowed that in the picture, your horizon tends to change in terms of a lot of these interpretations. And one of the horizons that changes dramatically is that the current scientific consensus is to reject the idea of a designer. Intelligent design is one of the most maligned uh, ideas in science right now. Yeah. This is a restricted view. It's, it's not open. Uh, it's uh, no way to find truth in case God exists. And, and this is one of the keys, is that science can do just fine as long as nobody really cares. And people will try to be objective in that case. But when it starts to hit you personally, that objectivity is a lot harder to maintain. Yeah. A lot of science can be done without uh, invoking those questions, but when we get into those questions, that's where it's not only interesting, it's very significant. Anyway, uh, uh, we'll uh, have another presentation next week, and then uh, um, in two weeks, the, uh, uh, we'll be uh, meeting with the Advent Hope Sabbath School. So. What's next week? What? What is next week? Uh, well, I'm still working on that.